once you understand this commodity chain is the sort of central thing that's activating this. And this has got, this has got to do with banks, but it's not, um, it's not just to do with banks. And in fact, most of these are private transactions. And they're transactions that, by and large, are not really available to us as historians necessarily because they're in the Bering Archive, they're in the Brown Archive. Some of those we have access to and some of them we don't. But this is mostly private lending, not public lending. Um, what Jackson does with the species circular is he's concerned about the doubling of the price of cotton in the space of between 1830 uh, and 1836. Uh, the doubling, in fact, of the, of the, the which is effect, uh, brought about in part by the doubling of the uh, actual cotton that's being shipped. The specie circular says that those Dixies and those other state bank notes cannot be used to buy uh, land, that land has to be paid for with, with specie. Um, in, in the other part of the specie circular, he changes the relationship between silver and gold. Effectively, he makes gold uh, the new requirement uh, for delivery. And it turns out that uh, when you break that commodity chain, the whole circuit of transportation then suddenly becomes unstable. The same time, August and September of 1836, that Jackson issues a spe specie circular, the Bank of England, concerned about Jackson's conflict with the Bank of England, uh, with the Bank of the United States, concerned about um, what they see as a troubling bubble in assets in the United States, uh, suspends all loans to the seven houses. That is, it refuses to act as the backstop for the loans from the seven houses. It does this for about a week. Brown rushes <laughs> to Threadneedle Street and convinces the Bank of England uh, to very quickly, uh, and I'm relying here on Jessica Lepler's uh, dissertation, um, a very, very good, dis very fine dissertation for this sort of understanding of this side of this panic. She points out that this is critical to understanding why this, uh, why this uh, c collapse is happening on the on the British side of this. But basically, what happens is at two different places along the commodity chain, there's the uh, normal relationships are severed. Uh, not surprisingly, about three months later, uh, which is these are 90-day bills of exchanges, so it's not surprising that it would take about 90 days for this to happen, what we see is a drop in the price of cotton by 40% and the beginning of a serious uh, financial crisis. Jackson's war in the Bank of the United States starts in 1832, roughly, and extends all the way through 1837. Um, is, uh, I, I, I have a sort of a, uh, a different, a, a fairly different take on this. Um, one of them is, of course, this is a replay of Jefferson's war on the First Bank of the United States. And, the, and the, the, the battle against a white whale that is, you know, the, the institution, the Second Bank of the United States, is very much like Jefferson's war on the First Bank. And, and it, it raises a sort of political um, significance of the Democratic Party in, increasingly. Um, but Jackson, who is, is cannot be trusted uh, to be <laughs> about very much, uh, the most paranoid man uh, and dangerous man probably in, in the United States as a president, um, is right about the Second Bank of the United States in just the way that Jefferson was right about the First Bank of the United States. Nicholas Biddle, up here on the left, in 1832, he hears that Jefferson is, uh, sorry, in 1831, he hears that Jefferson, uh, in, in his message to Congress, uh, that Jefferson wonders about the constitutionality of the Second Bank of the United States. Biddle then reaches out to a man named James Watson Webb, in the lower right, the New York uh, uh, Commercial and Advertiser, I think is the name of his newspaper. It's one of the highest circulating newspapers in the country at this point. And James Watson Webb is in Jackson's inner circle. And through a third party, he provides loans. Uh, James Watson Webb is in some serious financial trouble and uh, provides loans directly to James Watson Webb and uh, the New York uh, Commercial and Advertiser. And two days later, Webb's paper comes out against, uh, in favor of the rechartering of the Second Bank of the United States and opposed uh, to Jackson. Uh, Biddle then, through a third part, second party, uh, then tries to buy other newspapers uh, and is rebuffed by some of them and, and accepted by others. James Watson Webb's an important character. He's almost, uh, uh, he's so little talked about, but he's critical. He is, w was in Jackson's inner circle. Um, and it's Jack, that it's uh, James Watson Webb that coins the term Whig to describe the new party that Biddle will help to create in opposition to the Democratic Party. And, and James Watson Webb is, is the kind of intellectual architect of what, what will become 
uh, the Whig Party. So, so um, you know, Jackson is not far wrong that the Second Bank of the United States, fearing Jackson, is bound to, determined in a way, to create a party that will um, provide opposition to him. The, the thing that ultimately makes the, the Whig Party successful and powerful is, of course, the Panic of 1837, which happens just as Jackson is leaving and Van Buren is, is coming in. And that sort of built, in many ways, builds a constituency uh, for the Whig Party that opposes him. Um, the Second Bank of the United States does not last a whole lot longer uh, than 1837. Uh, if, you, if you'll remember from uh, the U.S. survey, uh, basically Jackson removes the deposits from the Second Bank of the United States. He deposits them in what are called the pet banks. Without this capital, the Second Bank of the United States is in trouble and it teeters and it finally collapses with uh, 17 cents in the Treasury uh, when it's, uh, and, and lots and lots of bills do. And I think, I think it's 1839, so it's a couple of years later. 